This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 14th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the yuppie version of fiscal responsibility, as reflected in a recent ADN op-ed. Second, we explain why, as proposed, the governor's gasoline tax suspension isn't saving Alaska families anything, but just shifting government costs from one set of Alaska families to another. And third, we discuss why we are concerned about the newest front in the North Slope producer wars and how it impacts Alaskans. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into the weekly top three. So first and foremost, this uh, editorial from the ADN board, which, uh, boy, I've got some things to say about this. They obviously are listening to the program. Uh, They quote me without actually quoting me. I mean, maybe somebody else is saying this, but I haven't heard a whole lot of other people say it. But let's talk about it. You call this the yuppie view on fiscal responsibility. Yeah, so this uh, ADN editorial, which ran, which goes back to March 5th, I think it was, has the headline, What Happened to Fiscal Responsibility? And it is uh, from the ADN uh, uh, editorial board. It's not, a, it's not an outside opinion writer. It's uh, from the editorial board itself. Um, and the, and the, the sum and total of the argument is that they're objecting to even the energy relief component. Uh, of uh, of the payments to uh, Alaska residents that uh, that the House uh, uh, Ways House Ways and Means well no House uh, Finance Committee has come up with as a way of uh, as a way of supplementing uh, the PFD it's a way of getting to POMB fifty fifty PFD without uh, actually saying that's uh, that's what you're doing and and this editorial is objecting even to that arguing that the money would be better used. Uh, it reinvested instead of instead of instead of paying out the energy relief, uh, reinvested back into uh, back into either the CBR or the permanent fund corpus itself, uh, and set up to uh, produce more earnings. and And they go on and they talk about uh, w- what the what the interest could be or what the earnings could be on that money if it were reinvested and what it could pay for down the road. This is this is. Uh, this is part of a movement that I hear about occasionally, uh, particularly among ya- uh, Anchorage young urban professionals, yuppies, uh, about you know really what we ought to be doing is not paying out the PFD. We ought to be building up the permanent fund and we ought to be building it up there. They have a target. They wanna get the permanent fund to a hundred billion dollars. And then what the permanent, and then their vision is of what the permanent fund can do is spin off enough money, enough earnings to pay for the budget uh, without having to rely on oil. Um, and so it's sort of this, it's this goal of getting the permanent fund built up to a point where it sort of funds the ultimate trust fund baby, right? It right, ultimately right. funds all uh, of Alaska yeah. uh, for, uh, uh, on out into the future. The problem with that is, is let's just take three seconds to analyze who's paying for that yuppie nirvana. It is middle and lower income Alaska families, not only now who take, who take lower PFDs in order to fund this yuppie nirvana, uh, but it's middle and lower income Alaska families 
once we get to the yuppie nirvana to continue to fund it because you take all of the earnings, virtually all the earnings, and you use it to fund government. The goal is, uh, and they're, they're, they're upfront about this because I don't think they understand what they're saying. Right. The goal is to never pay taxes, not pay taxes now by using, by using the PFD, diverting the PFD to government uh, instead, of, instead of other alternative revenue measures um, and, and not pay taxes in the future by diverting the permanent fund earnings to government and not having to fund it through alternative revenue measures. And the reason I call it the yuppie nirvana is because the only people who benefit from that are the top 20% who, who are better off using PFD cuts to fund government than they are alternative, uh, alternative uh, uh, revenue mechanisms. It, it is, I, and so the, the people who you find, like, like, the, like, the, like the ADN editorial writer, the people who you find who advocate this are people who either now or visualize themselves in a few years being in the top 20%, well into the top 20%, and being one of the beneficiaries of diverting the permanent fund dividend uh, off, to, uh, off to pay for government. And it's really, I mean, it's, w- when I talk to somebody, uh, uh, there's an there's a Anchorage assemblyman that I've talked to about this uh, on, on a number of occasions. And when you talk to somebody, they go, oh my gosh, you know, we can have, we can have free government forever uh, if we just get to this $100 billion mark. Well, yeah, but whose pocket are you taking that out of? Who is paying? Nothing comes free. Who is paying for this for this nirvana <laughs> of free government forever? Well, it's middle and lower income Alaska families. Oh, well, I never thought of it that way. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it, I don't think they understand. They just have got this vision of we're going to build the PFD up to $100 billion. And, and you know, the angels are going to appear in the sky and, you know, the bluebirds are going to sing all day long. And, and we're going to have this. We're going to have this great government going forward, and that's what that's what this this that's what this op ed is driving at. This op ed right. is saying, don't spend money on current Alaska families. Don't distribute uh, a portion of the earnings to current Alaska families. Reinvest it and and get that permanent fund balance up and get those earnings up. So we, when we get to be the top twenty percent. In, in a few years, we don't ever have to pay for government and we get to, we get to continue on down the road. Right. It's, it's just, it's, 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 you know, I would, I've never talked to anybody in the bush who thinks about it this way. I've never talked to anybody, even in Fairbanks, who thinks about it this way. It's the Anchorage young professionals, young urban professionals who, uh, who are, who are, who have this vision and keep driving toward it. Right. And, and again, they ignore realities. I mean, there's some quotes in here, first of all, Uh, just some of them just blow my mind. I'm hoping that we won't get too much into wanting to spend and maybe put more towards savings. Representative Neil Foster said a week ago, signal signaling admirable restraint after years of tight budgets. Where have they been in all the years since 2015 or 2010, 2012 that we've been spending like drunken sailors? I mean, have we cut back? Yes, we've had to, but overall we're still spending more than we should. But it's admirable resp- uh, restraint, uh, you know, and then they quote uh, Adam Wool. you know, I'd rather not be like drunken sailors and give a f- big fat PFD, but he's OK with being a drunken sailor and spending all the money on state government. As long as it goes to government, it's good. If it goes to the people, it's bad. Yeah, well, I mean, Adam, Adam is sort of like the, the, the old yuppie, right? I mean, Adam is one of those who, who doesn't want to pay taxes. Um, wants to take the money out of hand out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. I mean, they're they're afraid to pay taxes. They're afraid to you to to fund government by taxes because then they know the top twenty percent is going to focus on government, and then they know that all of the ways that they that they that they have raised the cost of government and all the all of the things that they've done for increased government are going to come under scrutiny by people who can actually do something about it. People who can actually put rep pressure on the representative top 20 percent people can actually put pressure on the on the on the representatives because that's the donor class they are scared of taxes not because not because well in part because they don't want to pay them themselves but they're also scared of it because then they'd have people scrutinize the government programs in a way that uh, that that something could actually be done about it so it's uh it's it's uh <laughs> it, it it you know it it, it has this allure to you know, to the to the young professionals that I talk about about oh my gosh, if we could just get to this hundred billion dollars, everything's going to be okay. We'll never have to have taxes in the state, 
and they just don't think about who is paying for this nirvana uh, that they're trying to build. Not only who is paying now for this nirvana in terms of people that, that won't get the PFD, that should get the PFD because they're, they want to reinvest the money, but people when they get to the nirvana who are going to continue to have their PFDs cut because they need to take all the money at that point uh, to, help, uh, to help fund government. So it's a, it, it, it's a humorous, in a way, uh, position that, that I hear uh, people argue, uh, but it's disappointing uh, also in the, in the number of uh, people who buy into this. I mean, it's like, it's like none of our young urban professionals in Anchorage have taken economics classes. They don't <laughs> understand that, that, that somebody's got to pay for this nirvana that they're trying to build, and they don't think through who it is that's paying for it. All right. So two points before we move on, just that I want to make really quickly. First of all, and Sandy makes this point in the chat room as well. Uh, I think that there's a whole bunch of naivete uh, amongst these uh, yuppies uh, and urban professionals who keep saying, oh, we'll get to that hundred billion dollars and then government will be fully funded and it'll be fine. Not if the track record of spending in this government is any clue, the spending will just increase to consume all the money and then more. They'll want more because that's historically what's happened here. This is the whole argument about, you know, well, we'll give them some taxes and it'll all be fine. They're going to spend every dollar and then some, whatever they can do. It will we'll always be some kind of fiscal crisis. That's my first point. The second point, Rob Myers in the chat room, Senator Myers says, when they fund government from Wall Street, the government will care what Wall Street thinks, not what Alaskans think. And that's something that nobody's ever really touched on as well. Your thoughts before we move on? Well, it's, it's I mean... Do we think about what the oil companies, have we thought about what the oil companies think uh, in the past? Uh, yeah, we have. So, I mean, it's a good point to, uh, uh, to say that, we'll, uh, that, that government will now care about, uh, care about Wall Street. But it's just, it's, it's the, I mean, my fun, what I want to go back to is my fundamental point is that it's these young urban professionals in Anchorage that think they've got, you know, the clue to free money, the clue to crew to, the, the clue to, to uh, you know, never having to pay for government uh, uh, themselves. And, and they don't understand that it's on somebody's back. They're always doing it on somebody's back. Somebody's going to pay and the people who are gonna pay are middle, even upper middle uh, income Alaska families uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of PFD cuts. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, number two is on the way. Give me, uh, give me a quick tease here before we take a break. Well, it sounds like you covered it uh, some yesterday. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the gasoline tax and uh, and what I think is uh, is missing. Again, you know, when I read some of the reactions to it and some of the comments for it and some of the support for it, particularly from the governor and others, you know, my my first reaction is: Do you guys not has no one taken an economics course? Because again, somebody's got to pay. I mean, there's nothing free in this world, right? If you cut back on revenue from uh, the gasoline tax, somebody's going to pay. And we're going to talk, and I want to talk about that. Look, I mean, I, as I said before, anytime we can suspend a tax uh, or hiatus it or holiday it or whatever, I'm in favor of that. I mean, generally speaking, just as a general rule, because taxation is theft. And, and I, I mean, I fully believe that in my heart of hearts. Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, I don't think that th this is just basically, as I said earlier, the bread and circuses um, effect, where essentially... Uh, they're, oh, look at this shiny object over here. We'll give you the gas tax. We'll give you the $1,300 energy rebate. We'll do, look at all the things we're going to give you. This is the shiny toys for election season. And uh, I guess, Brad, I don't want to get into this too much before we jump back into the, uh, jump back onto the radio. But, uh, you know, your, your early thought on that, I guess, before we move on here. Well, it's a diversion, right? I mean, they're still cutting uh, more than a billion dollars from the PFD. I mean, the POMB 50-50 compared to this year's statutory PFD is, is a billion dollars uh, less. Um, and so it's, it's a diversion. It's, it's look at all the good things we're doing for, for you, all the pandering we're doing for you. We're going to give you this energy, this energy relief. You know, we don't really need to do that, but we're going to do that because we're good guys. We're going to suspend the gas tax. We don't really need to do that, but we're going to do that because, 
because we're good guys. But don't look over here. I mean, as you say, it's sort of the squirrel thing. Don't look over here where we're cutting a billion dollars out of the uh, out of the out of the statutory PFD. And it's not just the legislature; it's the governor. I mean, the governor's cutting a billion dollars out of the out of the statutory PFD. The governor right. is arguing for a, uh, for a, a suspension of the gas tax. So, it's it's it, it is the ultimate squirrel in the sense of. You look at all the good things we're doing for you, but don't look over here at the at the very, very bad thing that we're doing to you. Right. Well, I mean, I will say again, <clears throat> if they could pass a gas tax, I'm all for it. If they can if they can give us uh, a thirteen hundred dollar energy rebate or whatever they want to call it, I'm all for it. Uh, I mean, I think because that's a way to, now it's not the idea. What I'd really like to see is a full statutory PFD, which would be more than the thirteen hundred dollars. But it's just, you know, it's not going to happen right now. I will take anything that they will give, but I also understand while I'm taking it that it is a distraction, that it is nothing more than an obfuscation of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Well, Michael, we're going to talk about this when we get back when we get back on the air. But the gas tax, they're not giving you anything. They're 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 giving it in one sense. They're giving money to you in one sense but they're going to have to take it away. I mean, uh, government budgeting is, is a zero sum game. So if you give up revenue one place, you're going to have to take revenue back either this year or in, or in subsequent years, someplace else. And, and, and where, where is that additional revenue going to come from? Where's the makeup revenue going to come from? Well, it's going to come from PFD cuts. And, and when it comes from PFD cuts, they're going to, it, the, the PFD cuts are a more aggressive tax than even than even the gasoline tax. So they're going to take it more from middle and lower income Alaska families when they when they take it back uh, than than they're than they're giving than they're giving you back. It's a it's a con game. There is no there is no free tax relief that you're getting out of out of the gasoline tax. The bottom line is is that Alaskans uh, you know we're getting the government we deserve, not necessarily the one we want. Um, we're getting the government we deserve, and since we're not paying for it, everybody seems to be fat and happy. I mean, we are paying for it. We just don't see it in the form of stealth taxes, whether it's the original royalty going straight to the state and bypassing us or whether it's the uh, <clears throat> or whether it's the taking of the PFD. Either one of those things. There's still a stealth tax that we're, that we're being charged, and so many people just want her around going, oh, at least I don't have to pay state taxes, <laughs> you know, at least I don't have to pay state taxes, you know. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating. We're diving into number two, which is the, uh, the new gas tax revocation or suspension that they're talking about, uh, which we talked about yesterday on the show pretty extensively, the bread and circuses routine. Um, uh, but Brad, uh, has taken a little bit of, uh, he's taken a little bit of a uncture with what I just said, which I basically said, I'll take any suspension of tax you want to give me. I'll take any of that. I'll take the rebate. I'll take the gas tax suspension. Uh, anything that we can do in that regard to starve the government of some money is good in my opinion, but your argument is Brad, that it's got to come from somewhere. Hit us with number two. Oh, well, we're not suspending. We're, 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 we're not reducing government. I mean, that's the thing. The governor announced uh, uh, suspension of, uh, his support for suspension of the gas tax. Probably half the legislature by now has, has supported uh, suspension of the gas tax, but no one has said, and because we're going to have less revenue, we're going to have to reduce spending over here. No one has said that. There's no, there's no offset uh, 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 being proposed for the reduction in revenues that are going to be represented by the gas tax. So, so what's going to happen? If you don't have a reduction in spending, then you're going to have to make up that revenue at some point. Now, maybe we can draw it out of savings this year, or maybe you know, we'll just draw it out of the surplus that's being built up by oil prices. But at some point, by not having offset the reduction in revenue with a reduction in spending, at some point, you're going to have to make up for it. And what's the marginal source of revenue in this state, at least right now? It's PFD cuts. So what's going to happen ultimately is, is yes, everybody's pandering. Yes, they're going to look out for you. Yes, they're going to give you, what, $40, an average of $40 per year and reduce gasoline taxes. Whoopee. Oh, my oh my gosh, isn't that great? But guess what? At some point, somebody's going to have to make up that revenue. The government's going to have to make up that revenue. As long as the marginal source of revenue is additional PFD cuts, 
That's where it's going to come from. So who is really paying for the reduction in the gas tax? Middle and lower income Alaska families at some point uh, through uh, through additional uh, additional PFD cuts. It it is it is pandering pandering of the worst sort to go out there and say we're gonna we're gonna reduce your costs, we're gonna reduce your revenue on the one hand, not reduce state spending, and then ultimately you know come back and grab it out of your pockets. A lot of people oppose the gas tax. A lot of people uh, uh, raise issues about the gas tax because it's regressive, right? It hits it hits middle and lower income Alaska families harder as a share of income right. than it does than it does upper income families. Well, guess guess what? There's one more regressive, even more regressive tax uh, when you look at the numbers. One more regressive tax uh, than than the gasoline tax. It's PFD cuts. So we're replacing one one regressive tax. With with layering by 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 another even more regressive tax uh, on top of it, if the governor had said if the governor had said we're going to reduce the gasoline tax because because we think it's an unfair burden and because of that we're going to reduce spending over here by the equivalent amount so that it won't come out of anybody else's pocket we're going to take it out of government's pocket if he had said that great I'm all for it but that's not what he said that's not what any legislator has said. They just said, we're going to give you, we're, we're not going to charge you this money. We're going to have less revenue in the government, but we're not going to cut spending. So we're going to have to make up that revenue somewhere on down the road. It, it, it is, it is, again, I have to ask the question sometimes, has anybody in this government taken economics? Because it's just fundamental economics. If you cut revenue, you don't cut spending, you're going to have to make it up with additional revenue from someplace else. So, Brad, your answer to this obviously would be if, if we pay a full statutory PFD, then people that there goes your energy rebate. There goes your gas tax. Right. I mean, that offset forty dollars a year per person. OK, great. So my family, you know, we get an extra two hundred dollars a year or something, two hundred and thirty dollars a year. Uh, congratulations, you know, on, on that versus, you know, what if we all got our forty two hundred dollar dividend? And then it would really put the squeeze on government to try and do well with what's remaining, right? I mean, that's really the point here. Yeah, yeah. I, but but it, 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 the point is, you nothing's free in government. It's a zero-sum game. Nothing's free. You reduce revenue one place. If you don't cut spending, you have to you have to make up the revenue. You have to make up the revenue someplace else. Um, so again, bread and circuses, that's really, I think, again, this, this goes back to the whole, again, shiny, shiny thing. Uh, look at what we're doing here. We're going to, and these are, uh, I think blatantly, and I think I said this during the break, but these are all blatantly the shiny toys of reelection season. Look at what we gave you. We gave you a $1,300 energy rebate. Look at, I mean, look at us pound our chest and we gave you a uh, suspension of your gas tax, which saves you a whopping forty dollars a year. But we did spend two thousand four hundred dollars of your dividend. I mean, but don't pay attention to that at all. Exactly, exactly. And there's no trans. I mean, this could go back to a number of our conversations. There's no transparency transparency in the legislature that lets you know that's what's happening, right? Ledge finance doesn't do the analysis on where the money's coming from in terms of PFD cuts. They don't do the analog- analysis on who's paying for government, who's paying for your gas tax uh, 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 relief uh, in terms of in terms of increased uh, PFD cuts. They don't do the analysis of who's paying for it. So it, it is all, it's, it's all a diversion. I mean, it's look at it, ultimate game of squirrel, shiny new toys, but don't look behind the curtain. Don't look at, don't look at what we're doing uh, uh, behind the curtain. All right, well, let's, uh, that's number two again. Bread and circuses and a more regression and somebody's got to pay for it. And why don't we just get our full PFD? I think that sums up number two uh, fairly well. Let's move right on to number three, where we're going to talk about the oil wars and how they affect us here in the state of Alaska and what the goods and the bads and everything else. What's what's going on here? Nat Hertz has what to me as a as a former oil lawyer is what is a great column or a great article uh, in yesterday's or two days ago, ADM. Uh, the headline is, Alaska's next big North Slope oil project is mired in a feud with ConocoPhillips and reportedly for sale. 
and this focuses on PICA, on oil searches, uh, now Santos's uh, PICA project, uh, and, a, and a, a, a dispute that's going on between, between oil search with respect to the PICA project and Conoco over access to roads uh, on, uh, uh, on, on state lands. I mean, state, state surfaces, uh, but they are state services that Conoco has the mineral lease uh, mineral lease rights on, and 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 basically, th this is what I spent, frankly, a big part of my career on these these as an oil lawyer these intra producer battles, where one producer tries to get leverage over another producer. Um, uh, in the old days, it used to be about facility sharing. It used to be about. Uh, I remember that. Uh, 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 one producer uh, on the North Slope wanted access to the gathering system that Conoco's built for uh, the Caparic field uh, and the Alpine field in order to bring their oil uh, off of their uh, off of their project uh, uh, through the Conoco system and, and ultimately get it into taps. Conoco, uh, just just the same as is going on here, Conoco uh, objected to that, wanted to charge an arm and a leg for it. And ultimately, the producer would have had to build a duplicate system, duplicate to Conoco's, to build to, to be able right. to get its oil off of off of the uh, the slope. The economics of that were horrible. They 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 really worked against the interests of the of the economics of the field they were trying to develop. Um, and and ultimately, that producer didn't develop that prospect because they couldn't get aspect because the economics didn't work uh, uh, when they couldn't get ac access to uh, Conoco's system. What Conoco's defense is in that case and what Conoco's defense is here is, hey, we build it. You know, we, we, we invest our money in it. We use it. We want to have the flexibility to use it in whatever fashion we want to use it. If you want access to it, you know, like a toll road, we're going to charge you for access. And what Conoco's calculation starts at when they, when they look at the charges is not what it costs them to build the facility, but what it would cost their, the, the person asking for access, what it would cost the person asking for access, what, the, what, what they would have to spend to build, to build a, a, a duplicate facility right. uh, if Conoco, Conoco didn't give them access. And then a penny less than that in order to provide an incentive to use Conoco's facility <laughs> as opposed to having to build a duplicate facility. <laughs> but, but that makes a lot of field economics, a lot of, on, the, on the North Slope, a lot of field economics uh, 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 very difficult. And what this article is going into is a discussion of how that 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 uh, 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 back and forth between Conoco and Oil Search is affecting the development, is affecting the economics of the Pika project, uh, and potentially uh, undermining the uh, the economics of the Pika project. These are important issues, and and the state has a role in these issues because we're talking about surface, we're talking about state lands. All of these right. facilities are on state lands. And the question is, the question is whether the government ought to play a more active role. The reason this was the reason that this constituted a large part of my career is because the government very rarely stepped in. They let the, the they let the private parties fight it out. And that's, you know, you can understand that to a point, but when it comes to the point of making projects, North Slope projects, uneconomic, uh, because the parties can't agree. On a on a price that for the access to the facilities that that make you know new projects economic. When it comes to the point of making new projects economic, I think there's a role for government to step in. It, it is not just the Dunleavy administration. It's, it's it was the Walker administration before it, the pay or the the Parnell administration before it, the Palin administration before it, the Murkowski administration before it. It it's been this laissez-faire attitude of government has been consistent. Uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout the decades that we've had uh, the North Slope under development. Well, and, and but it, I, is, it is hurting North Slope development. Well, and I would argue that, I mean, as owners, uh, I mean, let's just say this was Texas or North Dakota. If I own the land and somebody came in and, and I'd, I'd leased the land to them to develop the to develop the uh, the, the minerals or the or the oil, um, I sure as hell would have a say if there was another player that wanted to come in and develop another patch. And couldn't do it because somebody didn't want them to play ball and they wanted to rebuild the duplicate the entire infrastructure. That makes no sense. I think as an owner, I would have a say in that. The state should have a say in that to say, let's be reasonable. Fair market value is fair market value, not this full cost less than one penny. That's ridiculous at that point. Uh, we got about well, 30 seconds. 
Well, the state does have a role to play it, but but they very seldom step into it. And they and they re, the reason the state doesn't want to get between producers. The state wants producers to work it out for themselves. But sometimes sometimes that doesn't happen, and sometimes it gets away, gets in the way of development. Nat's article indicates appears to indicate that this is one of those times it's getting in the way of development. And I'll be <laughs> following this to see how it how how All it right. continues to play out. I'm not a I'm not a huge proponent of government getting involved in like you said the laissez faire attitudes, but at this point, when somebody's got a stranglehold like that and it's our resource that's being developed, the state should step in to say, look, they can develop this field. You can make a profit. You Conoco can make a profit on being the middleman on that, but don't be ridiculous at some point. I mean, the state has to have some kind of authority to do that. Yeah, several years ago. Uh, back maybe in the Parnell administration, the state uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, did a study on shared facilities and what and what how the state should react to shared facilities. Um, and if I recall correctly, that went into how shared facilities should be priced. Um, I don't believe uh, that study ended up in being a report. I don't believe DNR has ever actually uh, uh, used that report uh, in um, in in pushing people to uh, to share facilities uh, up there. It may be time to dust it off uh, um, and and do it again. But there's a there's a hesitancy. I mean, you could understand somebody's invested money uh, to develop a, a, a facility. Uh, they claim that they need unfettered access to that facility, flexibility with that facility to be able to, to be able to, you know, do what they what they build it for, which is to help their investment. Um, and if you let somebody else have access to it, uh, it takes up, you know, it, it impairs your flexibility to it, to, to, a, to sure. a, an extent. Uh, and, uh, and you argue that, uh, you shouldn't want to do that. I, I understand all that, but you know, in the lower 48, here, here's the, here's the dissimilarity, the lower 48, they've got County roads, right? Government has built roads that people can get around on. Government has, has built infrastructure that people can use to help their development. Uh, on the slope, we haven't done that. The government hasn't done that. It's been done by the by the by the private producers, and and so the question is, how do you how do you give the benefits that you get in the lower forty eight by having all of that third party or government built uh, 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 facilities? How do you give the benefit of that to new producers on the slope? When the government hasn't made that investment, it's been done by done by private parties. Right. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think there has to be some kind of middle ground where everybody wins there. It shouldn't be a zero sum game. And I think that's the way it's been treated, unfortunately. Um, Brad, any tease for what's uh, coming up here on uh, um, on uh, next week or things you're watching right now? Give us a quick. Uh, we got about two minutes here. Give me a two minute tease here before we. Uh, well, t- today is release date for the spring revenue forecast, which right. is going to be markedly different than the fall revenue forecast. Even even uh, uh, as oil prices have settled down from the astronomical highs they got to in the last couple of weeks, uh, they're still significantly higher than uh, they were in the fall revenue forecast. So today is going to be a big day in terms of uh, spring revenue forecast numbers, and I'll spend a lot of time uh, uh, looking at those. And then now that we have spring revenue forecast numbers, I think you'll see house finance uh, kick back up uh, and uh, and work on uh, the their budget, the operating budget. I think you'll see Senate finance kick back up. They were just uh, waiting. Your, they were just waiting to see how much more money they were going to be able to play with, right? <laughs> well, the Dunleavy administration should spin it into how much more of a PFD they could give. They won't. I mean, they're right. stuck on POMB fifty fifty now, but. Um, it, it, it will be, first of all, Bert will say, I can just hear it now. Bert will say, well, those numbers aren't real. The spring revenue numbers aren't new, real. Oil prices are artificially up. We're not going to worry about that. We'll, we'll take whatever's left over and put it into savings. So don't, get, don't give me anything about, about increased revenues. Uh, the House, on the, other stand, on the other hand, will have pressure from everybody and his brother uh, to increase spending for, for their, uh, their special category. So it, it, it's a big week coming up in terms of revenues and the knock-on effect, uh, both in uh, Senate finance and in House finance. All right. Well, Brad, we'll be watching that, and hopefully I'm sure we'll have a discussion next week on the uh, on what's going on and what the uh, what the spring revenue forecast could bring for us and what it, what it bodes for the state moving forward. Um, I mean, again, I'm not uh, – 
I, I fully come to the realization or I guess to the reckoning that uh, that nothing is really going to get done this year. We're going to be stuck exactly where we are, and we're going to have to wait to see what next session brings, what the new election cycle brings, and I think that's what we're kind of s- stuck at, I think, right now. Well, it looks like it. I mean, House the House really wants to push through uh, a permanent change to the statute to go to 2575, but as you and I have talked on the show before, I think that's just a messaging bill. If, I, if, it, if it somehow got through the House, somehow got through the Senate, certainly I think the governor vetoes it uh, as, as part of his campaign strategy, if nothing else. So I think, I think mostly that's just a waste of time right now. Well, more uh, bread and circuses, my friend. That's kind of what we got. I appreciate you coming on board. Thanks for being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having, having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.